So he's able to use draw his observations, you see his data, particularly of Mars, to come up with his own model. So this picture will show you This is Kepler. You see the ellipsis. So Tycho Brahe, 1546, 1601. You see, Brahe hires him 1600. You see, he dies in 1601. <laughs> Fortunate. Maybe he was poisoned. We don't know. We can make a movie about it. Uh, Kepler poisoned him. <laughs> okay, and then Kepler, 1571 to 1630. Okay, so he's, he's working on his equations here. We, we're about to just learn the, his third law and, uh, you know, equations of ellipses and stuff. And the guy in the picture, Tycho Brahe, okay, the painting. <coughs> so that's no, a fake nose right there. Okay. okay, after he does all of this work, he concludes that no, it's the heliocentric model that's the best predictability and that best fits the data. So he says everything in my model is the same as the Copernican system except for Kepler's addition of his three laws. Okay, so he adds his own three laws of motion. Oh, this is kind of funny thing. Johannes Kepler's uphill battle. Oh, this is too big. Uh, so you see the orbit of a planet is elliptical. He's going after he does all his work. And this guy says, what's an orbit? This guy says, what's a planet? And this guy says, what's elliptical? So he's got to now explain every single one of the, <laughs> every single one of those. There's a lot of cool science cartoons like that. So his first law, 1609. So notice he's been working on this for a while because 1600 he was hired. By nine years, he says planets revolve around the sun in elliptical orbits, not in circular orbits. It's not perfectly circular, it's elliptical. Okay, so you can see here the... Let me Sometimes it's... Let's see, oh, there's the... Okay, so you can see here on the top, you got an, what the concept of an ellipse is. It has two foci, okay, the focus of ellipse. If you want to draw an ellipse, the best way to draw it is to get a string around the, the two, put some thumbtacks on the board, on the paper, and then just stretch the string and then get your pencil and draw the uh, ellipse that way, okay? So it's basically oval. And then depending on how close these two foci are, if you bring the two thumbtacks closer, and if you only have one thumbtack, it's going to be a circle. You see? So the circle is basically an ellipse with one foci, and the foci is the center. We call that uh, circle eccentricity zero. It has ex uh, zero eccentricity. If the two foci are farther apart, eccentricity 0.3, OK? And the farther apart they are, 0.5, farther apart, 0.7, farther apart, 0.96. So as the two foci get almost like infinitely far apart, you basically have a straight line. And the eccentricity is one, you see? So an ellipse is like an oval circle. The eccentricity of an ellipse defines how oval it is. Eccentricity zero means it is not oval at all. So this one, perfect circle, okay? Eccentricity ones means it is very elongated oval. Therefore, it is a straight line. So it would be kind of like this, taken to its limit. So what, what Kepler did, he took the orbits of planets, he put it on a piece of paper, started analyzing the orbit and seeing where the foci are mathematically, relationship, and then calculating what the eccentricity of these planets were. He goes, they're definitely not zero, you see? So he. Ha he was a very good mathematician, so he could do that. And he did this without the help of computer technology, without iPhones, without anything, <laughs> okay? So much more advanced than we are. So he determined the eccentricities of the planets probably about up to Saturn. Those are the naked eye planets, because Uranus, Neptune hadn't been discovered yet, you know? 
So Mercury eccentricity is pretty eccentric, 0.206. So it kind of looks like this. A little bit less than this eccentricity, but it's pretty eccentric. Venus, 0.007. Out of all the planets, the eccentricity of Venus's orbit is the closest to zero. So if I tell you which planet has the most circular orbit, Venus, okay? Earth, 0.017. So is, is Earth's orbit kind of elliptical? Yeah, kind of elliptical, 0.017. Mars, 0.093, larger than Earth. And then I jump, I jump through some of them. Pluto, of course, remember, uh, we used to think it's a planet, but this is one of the reasons that it became a dwarf planet. Its orbit is very elliptical, 0.248, okay? So, <coughs> and as we're gonna see, the orbits of comets, asteroids, and the outer dwarf planets, they're more elliptical. So Pluto's eccentricity fits more of those kind of objects, comets, asteroids, and dwarf planets. Comets might have eccentricities of 0 0.5, 0 0.7, maybe not 0 0.96, but they're gonna have wider eccentricities. So th that's one of the reasons why Pluto got demoted too, another reason. If we take a look at this picture. This shows you the eccentricity of the, the orbits of the planets. Okay, so if you look here at uh, Earth's orbit, uh, at, let's look at Venus's orbit. Venus's orbit is equidistant from the sun. So if I take my fingers, go like that, it should be pretty circular, okay? Mercury, if I put my finger here, see this one is smaller than this one. You see here? So when Mercury is here, it's farther away from the sun. So Mercury's orbit is pretty elliptical. Okay, how about Earth? You see, the, my finger, it's not the same. You see here? Here it's not the same. Here it's not the same. So I have to make it wider. Yeah, definitely Earth is elliptical. In the next lecture, lecture four, we're going to learn when is the Earth the closest to the sun? When is the Earth the farthest from the sun? Okay, it's in, in its orbit. Uh, Mars, oh yeah, Mars was the most elliptical out of those, um, out of the, other than Mercury, Mars is very elliptical. So if you go like that, oh yeah, it's not even the same. This is much bigger than this, you see? Then if you go to here, Jupiter, Jupiter looks pretty circular. Uh, Saturn, and then Uranus, and then Neptune, you can see. But look at Pluto here, okay? Pluto is way, way elliptical. See, as a matter of fact, it was closer to the sun than Neptune was from 1979 to 1999. That's where Pluto was in 1996. Closer to the sun than Neptune. And now it's probably somewhere here, 2013. So it's past it. And that's where the New Horizons uh, satellite is going. It's going to arrive there by 2015. Ooh, I think two more years it's left. It should arrive there, and we're going to get some new info on Pluto. When did they launch it? Uh, 2006. So it's like, it takes nine years to get there. Huh? It's still fast, but I mean, thousands of kilometers per second, you know, but between us and Pluto is 40 AUs. So that's hundreds and millions of miles, you know. Plus, it doesn't go in a straight line. It, it has to go, you know, curve in. It goes around Saturn. It uses a gravitational catapult effect. So they, we use the gravity of planets to save gas, you know. We go around the planet, and then it catapults us. So by doing that, we're wasting a lot of distance, you know? The satellites aren't going in straight lines, so. Um, could, could it change Neptune's orbit? Probably, probably not. 
Yeah, it's too small. Yeah, he's saying, can Pluto's orbit change Neptune's orbit? Probably not, it's too small. Uh, so, but your question will lead to something interesting. As, uh, in the last slide, there's something that we're gonna talk about. So as we can see here, it was the eighth planet from 79 to 99, it was closer to the sun. That's also a good reason that it got demoted because its orbit was too elliptical. Okay, now we go to, uh, now we're gonna go and actually see his second, uh, his third law of motion. We're gonna go first law, third law, and then second law. The third law was the one that he worked on for the largest, the longest amount of time because it required the mathematical relationship between the period of a planet and its distance from the sun. So it was the most mathematical one. So he came up with this relationship. It was in 1619. The period of a planet is proportional. The period means the amount of time it takes to go around the sun is proportional to its average distance from the sun. So the period squared in years is equal to the distance of the planet cubed in AUs. That's how you can use this law. It took him 10 years to prove this law, many, many years, but if you took my physics class, I can prove this in about five minutes using the uh, equation of Newton and law of gravity and stuff like that. It, it's easy to prove it. So it's not a really hard law to prove. I'm not gonna do it now, but you, we can now prove it in a few minutes time. So it's not that bad. But for him, of course, this was an empirical law based on his observations, you see. So how, how can we use this law? Well, if the distance of a planet is one AU, you simply cube one, one cubed is one, and then if T squared is one, you take the square root of one. So for the Earth, the law works by its very nature because it's based on the observations of the Earth. So for the Earth, it's not a uh, big deal. You get one AU is equivalent to one year. Okay, how would it work for another planet? Mercury. So if I tell you the distance of a planet from the sun is 0.38 AU, and I ask you to find its period, how would you do it? So what you're gonna do is T squared. You're gonna take the 0.3871, then you're gonna cube it. So you take your calculator, you can practice it now. You take your calculator, you raise 0.3871 to the power three. Another way to say this is you multiply it by itself three times, okay? So you go 0.3871 times 0.3871 times 0.3871, and you will get 0 0.0580, okay? <coughs> so if you don't have a calculator now, go practice at home or uh, learn this, or you can simply just go 0 0.03871 to the power three. Then what are you gonna do? If T squared is 0.058, then T is the square root of 0.058. So you're gonna cube the distance, then you're gonna square root that. So 0.24 years. <coughs> and if square root of that number is 0.24. Again, what does that mean? Big deal, we, are, we can do the math. <coughs> Tell us what that means, teacher, okay? <coughs> so what does that mean? Here we go. So if this is the sun and this is the earth, the time it takes the, <coughs> <coughs> oh, let's put it this way. So if Mercury's orbit is 0.24 years, that means um, Mercury goes around the sun once in the time that it takes us 0.24 years to go around the sun. So Mercury, if, if Earth and Mercury start out together as like a race, Mercury will complete the race in 0.24 Earth years. So what does that mean? Where will Earth be? Imagine this like a race. They're starting, and then it's like a car race going together, okay? 
So Mercury will complete the whole path 0.24 years. Where will the Earth be? 0.24 is approximately what? About a quarter. <coughs> quarter, right? Isn't it a quarter? 0.25 is a quarter. So that means Earth will have gone a quarter of the distance around the sun. Quarter is right here. Okay, so it today is what? Uh, February 27th, 2013. A quarter of a year is about how many months? Three months, right? Three months will take us to? If Earth and Mars, uh, if Earth and Mercury start a race, Earth will start in February 27th. By Mar May 27th, Mercury will have completed it. So if, if we're inferior conjunction right now, right? Will, will there be inferior conjunction in three months? Where will Mercury be in three months? So right now it's inferior conjunction, right? Mercury goes around, completes one race. We're over here. In three months, is it inferior conjunction? No, Mercury is going to have to travel some more. Earth is going to have to travel some more. And by the time Mercury gets here, inferior conjunction again. You see? So if today is inferior conjunction, three months later, Mercury completes one race. We've got to go a couple more months, a couple more months, a couple more months. Mercury goes like this, like this. Right there, inferior conjunction again. And then the same thing repeats. So when it's when it's, um, let's say, remember you were saying how it would take three months? Yeah, to three months to go around. Right, so when it's going to meet, then would it support, like, that is your superior conjunction? Uh, the su for superior conjunction, right. it's going to go like this, like this, like this. Like, let, let me do, like, a quick thing. Like this, 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 like this. Like about here, you see? That's superior conjunction. So superior, if, if today we start at inferior, it's going to go, this one goes really quick. So it goes like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like that. So when Earth is here, Mercury is here, superior conjunction. So that means uh, in about one month, one and a half months, superior conjunction. In three months, Mercury completes one race, but it's not uh, inferior, inferior conjunction yet. We've got to go some more, got to go some more until it happens. So this whole thing pattern continues and continues and continues. What's it called in their alignment? Uh, uh, inferior conjunction. This yeah. is inferior conjunction. Yeah. When they're opposite, superior conjunction. So in between, uh, in between, it's just in between. Uh, when it's the angle of greatest elongation, remember that I, I told you 28 degrees? That's called max, uh, angle of maximum elongation. And in between there, it's just called in between. Okay. Uh, what was I going to say? The other way, interesting way you can look at this is this. If your average lifespan for a man is 80 years on Earth, uh, average lifespan for a woman, 85 years. If you go to Mercury and live there, how many years will you live on Mercury? So guys, a average lifespan, 80 years. What happens? Your biological clock is based on how many times the Earth goes around, right? But Mercury will go around a lot more times. Okay? How many years will you live in Mercury? 80 divided by 0.24. Because every time the Earth goes around 0.24, Mercury goes around once. Goes around one more time. Every time, every, every three months. So 80 divided by 0.24 is approximately like saying... 80 divided by a quarter, 320 years. Woman will live 340 years on Mercury. Men will live 320 years. So you're going to have a lot more birthdays to celebrate, a lot more presents, OK? The first. Probably the first uh, 10 years of your life here, the first 40 years. So the first 40 years of your life, you were a kid. Your birthdays are a Chuck E. Cheese over there, you know? 
So uh, after that, so, <laughs> so you basically uh, have a lot, lot more years and a lot more birthdays to celebrate because every time it goes around once, that's like a whole year for you, okay? Okay, how about Pluto? It's the other extreme. Okay, then you take this number, you cube it. 39 AUs, you cube it, you get this huge number, 61,767.59, and then you square root this number. Again, same procedure, 248.53 years. This is opposite extreme. So Earth is here, the Sun is here, Earth is here, let's say Pluto is here. Earth has to go around 248 times, so literally 248 times for the Pluto to go around once. So this is going to go, going to go, going to go, going to go, you know, and then Pluto is going really slow. So it's going to complete 248 paths of its circle, of its ellipse, you see. So of course, if you go there and live there, of course, it's too cold, you can't, but <coughs> if you try to live there, you're not even going to have one birthday. You're born, and when you're about Three months old, you die. Three Plut Plutonian months, you know. Sorry, no birthday, no gifts. Saturn. The distance of Saturn is 9.539. The period is 29. See if you can test it. Use your calculator and see if you can get the same answer as what I have. His second law, which was back in 1609, said a line from the sun to any planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. Again, this is something that we can prove in a physics class in a couple of minutes because it's based on the concept of angular momentum conservation. When there are no net torques on a system, the angular momentum of the system is conserved. So we can show that the gravitational pull on the planet causes no torque. And therefore, its angular momentum is conserved. So basically, the way you can visualize, you can say, imagine an uh, ellipse. Imagine two equal time intervals, like one month separated from one month. So let's say July 1st to August 1st, let's say, and then January 1st to February 1st. What his law is saying is that if a planet is far from the sun, it's got to go slow, and then this area that it sweeps must be equal to this area. So when the planet gets closer to the sun, what, is, what should it do? Okay, slow, fast, slow. The, when it's far from the sun, it's called aphelion. When it's close to the sun, perihelion. So aphelion is really slow, speeding up, speeding up. Okay, so between this month and this month, in the same time interval, it's got to cover f farther distance, right? This distance is bigger. This distance is shorter. Can this area equal this area? He's saying it's got to equal, right? Can it equal? Yeah. If this is shorter, if this is bigger, it, it can actually equal the area of this guy because this is shorter, but this is bigger, right? So the, uh, basically what his law is saying is to conserve angular momentum, the planet has to go shorter, the planet has to go slower when it's farther away, then when it gets closer, it's got to speed up, okay? If you think about it, this isn't really, sh shouldn't be too surprising for us because we already know about gravity. When a planet gets closer to the sun, the pull of the sun should get stronger, so it should make it speed up, you see? And that's how we do the catapult effect, by the way. When we go around planets, let's say we're trying to go to another planet. We go like this, and then we pick up a speed that way, energy. 
like that, and then it catapults us to another planet. You see. So this law implies that any planet has to go faster when it approaches the sun so that it can sweep out the same amount of area. Let's see, there's a, there's a picture here. Okay, you see how this is also a clip. You see here, it's slowing, it's gonna uh, slow down. This is equal time intervals. Equal time intervals, slow, it's getting slow, slow. See how it's slowing down? Half helion, then it's gonna start speeding up. And all these shapes have to have the same area. Pretty good. So this is, I like this, this uh, whole category of stuff that you're seeing here are called simulations. Okay, we simulate what we are seeing through a computer. 